want to welcome you back to our YouTube channel and uh, to the sermon for this week. Hope um, you are continuing to pray for our church. Hope you are continuing to look for your place uh, back among the body of Christ as you have opportunity in your community. Um, if you're in Hayes, please come. Uh, if you're not in Hayes, keep watching the video. Plug into a church family there. Uh, we need to interact with people. We need to sit with people uh, and to worship together, to pray together, and to sit in the Word of God together. I learn more with my brothers and sisters in Christ than I will ever learn sitting in an office, sitting in a living room. Urge you, as always, to get back uh, to your church family. We are James chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 12. We're preaching through, together, learning through uh, this letter. Pastor James has been separated from his church. They have been cast away, drawn away, forced away from Jerusalem by persecution. And here this pastor who's meet, used to meeting with them is writing, uh, longing for their growth. And he's hearing some reports that need to be spoken to. And one of those is about the tongue. Remember though, the big lesson we learned in chapter one, we're still following that outline. Uh, James said to his family, his church family, and the Holy Spirit saying it through him to us, be quick church, be quick to listen. And he's not talking about listen for the train coming. He's not talking about listen to the opinions around you or listen for the sale prices uh, coming up in town. He's saying, listen, be quick to listen to the word of God, to the truth of God, and not just to vibrate your eardrums with it, but to obey that word. Be quick to listen, to obey God. And then he moved on to, and be slow to speak. And he's picking back up with that thought here in chapter uh, three. Last time we spent uh, looking just at one verse, kind of a topical expositional uh, teaching about uh, this warning about teaching. Uh, he says there in verse one, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment if you remember the context there, James is writing to some Christians who are professing to be followers of Jesus, but they're not obeying the Lord. And he seems to be suggesting that some of those very people who are not walking in obedience are very quick to jump up to be everybody else's teacher. And that is a reality that we see in the pages of the New Testament. We see it in the pages of the Old Testament in the New Testament as well. And if you look around, you see it very, very distinctly today. A lot of people who aren't walking with the Lord quick to want to be your teacher and my teacher. And James is saying, don't do that. Instead, back up and learn to be a good follower, a good listener, a good obeyer of the word of God, and then see how God would use you to teach others. In the verses that follow, though, verse 1, he's hit this notion of teaching and using our tongue wrongly there. And then he begins to really lay out general teachings about the tongue. We called it last time a tiny terror in teaching. And this time he's just going on and he's saying, but you know what? The tongue is a tiny terror in general. Let's read together verse 1 of chapter 3. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. Amen. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, and he begins teaching us about the nature of the tongue. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by powerful or fierce winds, they're turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. And even so, why is he talking about horses and ships? Even so, the tongue is a little member and yet boast great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. 
For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in his likeness. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. I said that's the word of James much broader than that, much bigger truth than that. That's the Word of God. We understand the Holy Spirit of God has spoken through Him. Living Word, and that means that I can't teach it well and you can't learn it well without talking to the author. So let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the things that You teach me and remind me about my mouth um, and not the physical parts of my mouth not even the muscle of my tongue, but the way that I use that mouth. Uh, Lord, every single one of us that are listening to these words have been our own worst illustration and best illustration at times of how this mouth, how these words that we speak um, can do blessing and harm. Uh, will you please be our teacher today? Uh, will you please help us to look for application to live differently for having heard you speak to us today? In Jesus' name, amen. James has lots to say about the tongue here, and I unpack it this way. It's the way that makes best sense to me. It's expositional, meaning we're going to go right through the passage and just pick out what God has said here. Uh, first thing I notice is that our words are the greatest, one of the greatest revealers of our maturity as Christians. Our words are one of the greatest revealers of our maturity. There in verse 2, he says, We all stumble in many ways, but if someone doesn't stumble with his words, he's perfect. He's an absolutely mature man, able to also bridle the whole body. If, if you say, if you can control that tongue, you could control everything about you. Another way to put that, words are our clearest window into the reality of our heart. What we speak is of the clearest window into the reality of what's in our heart. And if we get to the point of bringing that tongue under control, we could control everything. I had a, a bit of a movie flashback. I'm not a big movie guy, but I used to watch uh, more of them than I do now. I just don't have time. But I remember The Karate Kid. Um, if you have not watched The Karate Kid, uh, finish watching this video. Go watch The Karate Kid. Come back and watch the video again. Uh, there was a couple of main characters. One is the young man, Ralph Macchio, and he plays a character named Daniel, or as the other guy calls him, Daniel Sun. And the other main character that calls him daniel son is Mr. Miyagi. And uh, Mr. Miyagi, in that movie, I remember he had one, one thing. There's one thing, he said, one thing. And if you could get this one thing, if you could develop the focus to do this one thing, the, the fine motor skills to do this one thing, you could control anything. You could master anything in your life. Does anybody remember what that one thing Mr. Miyagi said? If you could do this, you could master anything. It was to catch a fly in midair with a pair of chopsticks. And of course, Mr. Miyagi had not yet attained that one thing. And the funny part of the movie is that uh, Daniel's son, when he's in there with him eating one day, he catches one in the middle and makes Mr. Miyagi so mad. Loved that. That's kind of the picture of what James is saying here. This tongue is so, so fundamental, so core to us that if we could control, and so dangerous, if we could control it, we could do anything in this world. The, the poetry of the Old Testament makes a direct connection between our maturity and how we use our tongue. Just to share a few of those with you, Psalm 3730 says, The mouth of the righteous, the mouth of the righteous, speaks, and he says you can find the righteous by listening to him. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. 
Uh, Proverbs 10, 31 says, the mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom. Again, the tongue is the teller of the tale about what's in our heart and what's, what our maturity level in Christ is. Proverbs 31 is one uh, maybe a lot of you know. That is the, the uh, proverb about the godly, the righteous woman. And one of the things it says there, it says, she opens her mouth with wisdom and her tongue is the law of kindness. It's the very law of kindness. Uh, Jesus speaks also negatively about this tongue being a measure of our, of our maturity. And he's talking to some of the speakers of his day. And he says, you brood of vipers. That was kind, wasn't it? You brood of vipers. How can you being evil speak good things? He's saying you can't. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified. There's James's use of justified again in the sense of demonstrated. By your words you will demonstrate whether you are righteous. And by your words, you will be condemned. In other words, you will demonstrate uh, your lack of spiritual maturity. In all of those verses, the telltale sign of righteousness is a mouth that speaks justice and wisdom and kindness. So often when we go to the doctor, at some point he'll tell us to do what? Stick out your tongue. Why does a doctor do that? A doctor does that because, oddly enough, you can tell a lot about the health, the general health of a person by looking at their tongue. James is saying exactly the same thing. You show me your tongue in the sense of you let me hear the words that you're using, and I can tell you about your spiritual maturity. Same thing Jesus, his brother, says. James is a realist here. James says we all stumble with it. But he's also saying, but what a measure of our maturity. Another thing he goes on to teach us about the tongue is that our words not only are a window into our maturity, but our words have immeasurable power for good. Listen to verse 3 through 5. Uh, he gives us a few illustrations or examples, pictures to look at, to think about. Indeed, and they're all telling us how a little bitty thing can do great things including our tongue. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths. A bit is just a little bar. It slides in between the horse's mouth. It's connected to the reins. Indeed, we put this little bit in horses' mouths that they may obey us. And with that little bit, we turn a whole great big horse with it. Amazing what that little thing can do. Look also, verse 4, at ships. They are so large, they're driven by such powerful forces, such powerful winds, and yet they are turned by a very small rudder. Relative to the ship, the rudder is a tiny, tiny thing, and yet it controls. It has the power to control. That ship even says it will go wherever the pilot desires that thing to go, just because of that little rudder. Even so, and here's his point, even so, I tell you about horses, I tell you about ships, because it's telling us something about our tongue. Even so, the tongue is a little bitty thing, and yet it could do great thing. It boasts great power. I love the fact that both of these illustrations of a horse and a ship, James is teaching us something very subtly here. Both of those things require... If that little bit is going to do good in controlling a horse, if that little rudder is going to do good in steering that ship, both of them require a controller. And he even insinuates that in his wording. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouth. It, it implicates or it makes clear that there is someone putting it there and controlling it. If you've got a horse with a bit in his mouth but no controller, what's the horse going to do? It's going to do whatever the heck he wants to do. Same thing with a ship. He even says here, a ship has this little rudder that can do great things, but it has to have a controller. At the very end of verse 4, it, the, even though that little bitty rudder, it can go wherever the pilot wants it to go. 
we there with the horse and Pilate with the ship insinuates they need to have a controller. And when they have a controller, they can do amazing things. What can we do with a mouth, a tongue, words that are controlled wisely? My goodness, we can do, we can do what James is talking about here. We can teach well, right? We can proclaim truth. I think about uh, in Sunday school at our church, our, our adult class was going through Jonah. And I think about Jonah goes and with a righteous mouth, even, even if he didn't have, his heart wasn't in it where it should be, even with a right speaking mouth, J, uh, Jonah rebukes Nineveh and delivers a whole nation from the judgment of God. What a powerful thing that tongue under control did. We can speak rightly the whole counsel of God's word and be about edifying the body of Christ and bringing about maturity and growth in missions and growth in the kingdom. If our tongue is well controlled, we can share the gospel and see lost people like we once were come to salvation, come to be born again like we are. All of that with the tongue. The Bible talks about other general things joy, great benefit of this tongue if it's under control. Uh, it says the Bible teaches that if we have controlled tongue, we can bring about great personal joy. Proverbs, I keep going to Proverbs and Psalms, and but there's so much to be said there. Proverbs 12, 14 says this, a man will be satisfied with good and we, we would fill that in. A man would be satisfied with good if he had a lot of money. A man would be satisfied if he had the right wife or the right kids or the right job. Listen to what God says. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. What a word. Use your mouth wisely and it will bless you and bring joy to you. We can also extend peace to others. Again, Proverbs 12, 25 Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Boy, if there's a word for our day right now, anxiety and depression. Anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. What's the cure for it? But a good word, good word, a controlled tongue makes that same anxious, depressed heart glad. Do you know anybody struggling with anxiety and depression? I know more people than I can count. Matter of fact, I've been one of them in my life. Uh, struggled both with anxiety and with depression. And yet here is the cure. God says a righteous mouth. People who speak uh, justly and righteously and wisely and kindly can bless, extend peace to people who are in anxiety and depression. What a power this tongue has. But the lingering implication of those verses is this. If there's no one controlling that tongue, it's not going to bring about any of those great things. In fact, it's going to bring about chaos and destruction. And that kind of leads us to James' next thought. Not only can the, our words have immeasurable power for good, but they have immeasurable power for destruction. Look at verse 5 again. The second part of verse 5 says, But see how great a forest a little fire can kindle. How, look at how big a forest of wood a little flame can just devastate. And he's comparing that again to our words. Verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. So now we've gone from words like moving a powerful animal and steering a powerful ship to things like iniquity and fire and defiling, setting on fire the course of nature that is, and it, the tongue is itself set on fire by hell. Wow. James is saying, you could do so much good with your tongue and look at what we often do with it instead. So much evil. I hear on the news from time to time how hundreds or thousands and sometimes even tens of thousands of acres have been burned up. Out west, um, a lot of times we hear about it, California wildfires were crazy last year. How many acres have been burned up and how did it happen? It happened with a wayward spark from a little unkept fire. It happened with somebody pitched a little bitty cigarette with an even smaller little little flame on the end of it, pitched it out a window. And poof, 
Houses are destroyed. Animals are killed by the hundreds and people die by that one wayward little spark. My goodness. It is so often our tongue is a riderless horse, a pilotless ship, and a fire that is unkept. James even goes on in those verses to call the tongue a whole world of iniquity, as if all the sins of the world are contained in this little word maker in our mouth. And that seems to be an over-the-top statement, but I would just send you to Romans 1, where it talks about what people knew about God and what they said about God instead, and how it defiled the whole course of nature. Read Romans 1 this week. What a passage. This mouth, he says, James says, defiles the whole body. It's set up here at the top of our, the top of our body, and it just defiles everything all the way down. In fact, it defiles the course of life. And he goes on to say why. He says, because hell has lit it up. If the tongue is an unkept fire, that can bring such destruction. It has been lit up, he says, by hell. And James uses the word Gehenna there, and it's a word that Jesus used to describe the place of ultimate condemnation for people who uh, don't trust in him and are left to pay for their sins themselves. And James carries over that thought. He said, man, that place of ultimate condemnation is what has set on fire this tongue. Kent Hughes, a pastor that I have listened to in the past, says the uncontrolled tongue has a direct pipeline to hell. Wow, what a vivid image. Remember these truths the next time you excuse your wayward, unkept words. Sometimes we will say, well, I just, I always speak my mind. I hear that so much. I'm just speaking my mind as if we're justifying some hateful word because we're just speaking our mind. You might rephrase that instead, along with, in keeping with James here. Instead of saying, I just speak my mind, how about just saying, I often let hell speak through me. That would be more realistic. My tongue is a riderless horse. That might be another good one. My tongue is a rudderless ship. Or maybe you would just cut to the chase and say, I, I want to tell you, I said that because I have let hell set my tongue on fire today. We need to reframe the way we think about our tongue. It's almost a boast in our culture to say, I, I tell it like it is. I say whatever I feel, and that's a good, good thing. No, that is letting hell set fire to your tongue and kindle a whole forest. What kind of words are we talking about when we're talking about kindling and, and destroying destruction? Things like words of gossip. Words of gossip destroy things, whether they're true words or not. Did you know that? Gossip is not just telling false lies or telling lies. Gossip is telling sometimes true things but true things that are damaging and, and demoralizing to people around us. Words of gossip. How about words of bitterness? That's, that's a tongue set on fire by hell. I'm angry, and sometimes I get angry, and I let my mouth run when I get angry. Words of bitterness. That is a tongue set on fire by hell. Lies. Lies told to flatter others. Lies told to protect ourselves, lies told to get ahead, all of those are the same. That is hell, using your tongue. Words of rampant blasphemy is another um, terrible use of the tongue. And this one seems to be growing in the church culture even. Rampant blasphemy. What do I mean by blasphemy? I mean taking the holy things like Jesus and God himself and their name and misusing it. It is so common in our even our church culture to hear people say, well, God Almighty, when something uh, bad or uh, outlandish, God Almighty, or to hurt yourself, it's like, Jesus Christ. Um, or just this repetitive, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That is just rampant blasphemy. Think about who you're talking about when you stub your toe and shout, Jesus Christ, that's my Savior. That, that's the one man who's done it all right where I've done it all wrong, and yet he went as God in the flesh and died to pay for my sin. He is not a swear word. Um, God Almighty, God help us. 
as an exclamation. That's not what God is. God is almighty God. Our, our Jewish friends, um, whether they are believers in Jesus or not, they, they do such a much better job of revering the name of God. They won't so much as write it down for fear that they might trample it or that they might inadvertently throw it in a trash can. It's just that their thoughts are so much higher of God. He deserves that. He has commanded that of us. How about another misuse of our words? How about incessant complaining and criticizing? Uh, Go through the Old Testament and you'll find God has very little patience when it comes to his people complaining consistently. Uh, Why is that? Because complaining just dismisses every good thing that God has done for us. And he's done so much. Even if I'm in poverty, he's done so much for me. Even if I'm sick, he's done so much for me. Incessant complaining. How about filthy innuendo? Everything sexual. Everything relates to body parts. Everything's a body joke to everybody. That that's using our that is hell setting our tongue on fire. Hell is speaking when we do any of those things. And James goes on and says, and when hell speaks through your tongue, in verse eight, he says it spews deadly poison. When you and I talk that way, we are spewing deadly poison. I have watched that deadly poison at work in every church that I've ever been in. Um, As a member, as a a lay leader, as a pastor, I've watched the deadly poison of the tongue uh, destroy so many people. I had, and I'll include even our church here at Cornerstone, I've seen it here, seen it everywhere. We had a former member at a previous church, and uh, this person was just always bitter and always gossiping, and I watched over time, and this person would always, certain people would be drawn to this person, and they would get together, and pretty soon that person would be gone, and then another person would be drawn to that person, and pretty soon they'd be gone. I watched that happen three times, and I realized this is a bitter, bitter heart, and she spews deadly poison, and it's literally killing people out of our church, losing uh, people because It is so uh, infectious, that kind of talk. Church family, I'm speaking specifically to you. Don't poison the very people you were saved to bless. Your brothers and your sisters in Christ, don't poison the very people you were saved to build up and to edify in Christ. Now, James says, look, this tongue is the one of the best windows into your maturity as a Christian. I can look into that, your words, and see your heart and your maturity. He says the tongue is so powerful to do good, and yet so often we use it to do evil. And it is so powerful for evil. So what is the problem? Deals with that in verses 7 through 12. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. James takes us to the circus, doesn't he? And he says, man, look at, look at all the things that we have learned to tame and control. You go to the circus, you'll see uh, vicious animals, tigers and lions, controlled You'll see scary things like cobras. The little way they're they're fan out, ooh, scares me. They can be controlled pretty easily. Even large, large creatures like elephants controlled. They'll they'll even stack up on each other's back and and form these long trains hooking tails and 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 tusks, uh, trunks. It's amazing. And James says, we can do all of those things. And yet, verse 8, no man can tame the tongue. And he uses this phrase there, unruly evil. And, and the word, most literally, and I love this translation, is restless evil. It is evil looking to stretch itself out. I don't know how many of you have ever dealt with restless leg syndrome. Um, I deal with that sometimes. Uh, what happens when you go to bed? Something about laying out and relaxing at the end of a day and your legs are just aching to move. And it, and it just keeps on going until you finally just have to jump up and let them stretch, let them run. Um, I do that from time to time and it is just 
fretful. And James says that's exactly what your tongue can be like. It is this restless evil, and it just aches. Again, if it's not controlled, it just aches to stretch itself. Restless evil. If you could... um, if you could locate in the body where evil exists in us, the Bible tends to do it in two places predominantly. Evil is almost in a reservoir, it seems, in us, in our tongue and in our heart. The Bible says our heart is desperately wicked above all things. And then here James calls this, and Proverbs speaks well to it, calls this tongue this restless evil. It just wants to run and tear into people. And here's what James is saying. We can't fix it. I can't fix it. You can't fix it. Dr. Phil can't fix it. A self-help class can't fix it. And here's the, the, the tough thing for the pastor to hear. This listening to this sermon can't fix uh, your or my unruly tongue. The tongue is universally humanly untamable. Yeah, it's to that. The tongue also is universally and hopelessly inconsistent. Verses 9 through 12, he just says, my goodness, with this tongue, this unruly evil, this restless evil, we bless God. Oh, praise the Lord. What a, what a blessing of a father he is. And yet with the same tongue, what do we do? We curse the people who he's made in his image. That shouldn't be that way. Out of the same mouth, verse 10, come blessing and cursing. And he says it. It should not be that way. Um, Nothing else in nature is that way, he says. He goes on to say, you know, does does a a spring, does it do that? Uh, A spring of water? Does it one minute send out fresh spring water and another minute send out salty, uh, bad water? He said none of our plants. Life does that. Does a fig tree bear uh, figs one day and olives the next or a grapevine bear figs the next day? No, nothing operates like that except this tongue of ours. And it'll say praise the Lord one day and you idiot the next day talking to somebody that God has made. And here's the thing about this passage that gets me. James just leaves it right there. It's this unruly evil set on fire by hell, can do so much destruction. And then he just walks away and he starts talking about some other things, it seems. Except that he doesn't walk away. Um, if, if I don't want you to miss this. James doesn't walk away. There is hope for our tongue. It is humanly untamable. But it's not hopeless. Look at verse 13. He says in the next verse, and we won't, we won't keep going through this, but just, just to grab it so we see it. He, who is wise and understanding among you? What's the hope for an uncontrollable tongue? Wisdom. And not just any wisdom. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is pure and pure peaceable and gentle and willing to yield and full of mercy. All the things that the uncontrolled evil tongue is not. I need you to know that there is hope for this hopeless tongue in us. It is the wisdom of God from above. So the solution is this. It's not humanly tameable, but the solution is this. It takes a man or a woman repenting And what does repenting mean? Recognizing your inability and turning around from trusting yourself to start trusting the one above who can control, who can rebirth, regenerate you and make you what you are not. Turn to Jesus. That's the hope for our tongue. And not only that, but draw near to the Lord. I have never, ever attained righteousness in my life by simply trying to be better. How many of you have heard that all of your life growing up? You need to be better. You need to do better. You need to stop doing this and you need to stop doing that. And it doesn't fix things. And maybe the threat of punishment, maybe the threat of losing our phone will kind of snap us into shape for a little while, but it doesn't fix anything. I find righteousness when I draw nearer to him who is my righteousness. 
And Christian, that's exactly what James is getting at here. You are like horses. You are like a, your tongue is like a horse without a rider on it. Your ship, your, your tongue is like a ship without anybody controlling the rudder. And the solution is to repent of being, a, repent of this notion of what you're doing and to draw near to the controller who can control the horse, who can control the ship. Jesus is my righteousness. And here's the truth of all truths. When I am near to him, I am more like him. And, and the reverse is true too. When I am not near to him in my walk, in my daily time, in my thoughts, I am not acting like him. It's just that simple. And James is bringing, pulling these people he loves. He's pulling them back in to that truth. So what's the, the, the cure for this evil tongue? It is to repent and draw near to the Lord and then to do what James has been telling us. Be quick to listen to when God tells you something. Be quick to hear the rebuke of this passage and to respond to it in faith and obedience. Be like the Ninevites who are awful people, but when they heard the truth of God's word, they responded in repentance to it. That's what James is pulling us toward. You will find when you draw near to God, you will find a love for him that drives your obedience to him. You'll find a strength that empowers obedience to his word. Being slow to speak won't just be another command or a guilt trip to you. It will be more and more your desire and your nature simply because you've turned from your way to trust and to follow after Jesus. Um, it's, it's what we get in a real relationship with Jesus. And it may be that today your tongue is speaking very clearly to you. I believe great things about Jesus. I know great things about Jesus. I may even say I trust in Jesus, but my word, my mouth is a window to my heart that says I'm not walking with him. Come walk with him I am just like you when I'm not walking. I, and I'm saying that to those who find themselves wayward. I am wayward when I'm not walking with Jesus. And he's calling us back to him. Christian, hell had your tongue. Hell owned your tongue. And it can easily fire it back up again if you are not near to the Lord. I'll say this as a final thought. The cure is what I just said. Repent, draw near to the Lord, walk with him and let him change your tongue. But then there's some practical things that scripture does teach that we do need to obey as we're walking with him and empowered to obey his word. And these are just some general thoughts that I find in scripture um, to help me measure my words. And I'll just throw these out there to you. Number one is what I want to say. Is it true? That's a pretty easy question, pretty easy answer usually. And if it's not true, what do I do? I'm measuring my words, right? Oh, that's not true, so I won't, I won't say that. Um, is, your, is the word that you want to speak, is it God-honoring? Sometimes there are things we want to say that are true. That guy's a jerk. Is it God-honoring to say it? Um, I feel hatred to that person. Is it God honoring to say that? That's probably true. You do feel hatred toward. Is it God honoring to say it? Then don't say it. A third one, is it helpful? Is what you want to say right now, is it helpful? And I don't mean is it helpful to you because it gets something off your chest or it makes you feel better because you finally said what you wanted. I'm saying is it helpful for the other person? Again, if it's not, don't say it. Another question, is there a better way to say it to make it more helpful? Uh, I measure this out as a pastor, as a preacher of God's word. I'm saying the right thing. Is there a better way for me to say it to make it more, uh, more helpful to the people that are hearing it? Not to change it. Truth is truth. I don't have any right to change God's word. But how can I say it to make it more helpful? Maybe it's an illustration. Maybe it's a thought. We need to do that with our words toward each other. Uh, a last thought, is it... Is it vengeful? Is what I want to say here vengeful? And if it is, God's given us a great word. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. 
Um, let God handle it if your words are vengeful. I hope that's helpful to you. I hope maybe those last uh, few would be something to think through. But more than anything else, I want to do what James is trying to do, what the Spirit of God is trying to do. Your tongue is a helpless, hopeless mess. You need Jesus for it. My tongue is a hopeless, helpless mess. I need Jesus for it. Church family, let's draw close to the Lord and let him change us. And when he changes us, our words are going to change. God bless you. Thank you for hanging in there in this sermon. Again, if you find your way to our church on Sunday, please do. If you find yourself to another church where the word of God is taught uh, faithfully, um, where you can be accountable to other believers, love them and be loved by them and grow with them, all the better. Uh, praise the Lord for it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your words. Thank you for James. Thank you for how practical he is. Um, I'm asking you, Father, above everything else, will you help me to keep my focus on you? Will you help me to walk well with you that I will be more like you? And even that that uh, lightness would show in my words and that I would be, be a blessing to myself, to my family, to my church, to the world that we live in that is so messed up. And above all, that I would be honoring and glorifying to you. I pray that for me. I pray that for every Christian that's listening. I pray that for our church family in particular. And Lord, I do pray for a friend that's watching this who needs to hear um, needed to hear what Jesus has done for, for sinners. And I pray for courage for them that they would trust you. Um, thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have questions, you have uh, thoughts you want to share with somebody, if you want to talk about trusting Jesus as your Savior, our information is on this YouTube site. Our information is on our website and our Facebook page. Please contact me. I would love to hear from you. God bless you. Have a great day.